Well, whether you've been with us the last couple of weeks or not, we're picking up in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 and 18 again. Our message this morning is followers to leaders. Last week I did seekers and followers, and not everybody who seeks after God follows him. Some people seek God for a short season, and then they don't follow him anymore. And there were people who followed Jesus around at the beginning, especially after he fed them all with the, with the fishes and the loaves. They were there. But when that kind of stopped, they weren't so much wanting to eat of his body and, and drink of his blood. And that kind of turned some people off, and they went away. But the disciples said, who else has the words of life? Amen. So we're going to read this morning. I'm going to just read those two scriptures or three scriptures, and then we're going to pray. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. It said, And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Father, I just thank you right now in the name of Jesus for your word. I praise you and thank you for this time we've had with you, for the richness of your presence. But I thank you for your word as well because you have a, uh, a purpose for it this morning. I pray that we would all have hearing ears, that we would be doers of the word. And I thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. If a person is a follower, if we look at the disciples who followed Jesus, the people who was around him a lot, what we find is the people who had that close fellowship and relationship with him all went into leadership, so to speak. All the disciples became leaders. They were leaders in the early church. Uh, as they went out and they ministered to people, they raised up leaders. Paul, the apostle, uh, was mentored by some people after he had his Damascus Road experience. He tried to kind of strike out on his own, but he lacked that mentoring, and he just made a lot of people mad, and he had to escape out of Damascus and go off and hide for a while. But I believe that the Lord spoke to him according to his own testimony. The Lord ministered to him while he was in the wilderness, etc. But, you know, he worked with Barnabas and some other guys. He had the recognition, finally, of some of the, the apostles and the prophets we see there in Acts chapter 13. And... He had a great ministry, and he raised people up like Timothy and Titus, and he told them to raise people up. Amen? Followers become leaders. Now, some of you in here, the minute leadership's brought up, it's like, okay, check out. This isn't my sermon. But the truth is you're a leader whether you realize it or not because you have influence with people. Now, maybe you have influence on the job because you're a you're a manager or you, you're a foreman or whatever. You have some influence there. And maybe you're not even in a position of leadership, but just because you work with other people and you're around other people, you have some influence for good or for bad. Most of you have influence in your homes. Many of you have children still at home, and you have uh, the ability to be able to influence them. Many of you kids have influence with your classmates, with your friends. We all have the ability to influence people, and basically leadership is just the ability to influence people. That's all it is. Now, leaders, people who emerge out as leaders, people who have that kind of potential, or especially with that calling, they uh, have followers. And that's the only difference between us in leadership as a general Christian, being a leader, as being a disciple, and those who have followers, the ones who emerge out as, say, leaders in the church. It's because of the ability to be able to impart and to cause other people to follow them. I would like to say now that I have been very blessed by my kids. I joked about Daniel Dean, but Sarah, as you know, is graduating uh, she'll be uh, having a party next Sunday. I'm so excited. <laughs> you can tell. Duh. You know, my, my greatest gift is the ability to go, what? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. Anyway, we, uh, we're very blessed. And I got to say that I have to give most of the credit to Pastor Cheryl, not to myself. 
Everybody's nodding their head. Why is that? Uh, but she had a vision when we were young that she was going to homeschool. And that's a personal choice that people have to make. I would not have made that choice. I did not feel I had the gifting or the time and ability to be able to do that, but Pastor Cheryl did, and uh, she teaches at work. There's things that they have her teach, and she's uh, trained in different things, and uh, I don't know nothing about birthing babies. I'm just like Butterfly McQueen from Gone with the Wind. I don't know nothing about birthing no babies. And, uh, but Cheryl, she knows all that stuff, and she knows how to teach people how to do things and CPR and all this thing. I don't know. Anyway, stuff I don't even want to know about. You know, I don't even watch it on TV when it comes on. I used to watch the show ER, and I wouldn't watch half of it because I didn't want to see it, you know. (laughs) Anyway, but she had this vision that she was going to homeschool our kids. I don't know that that has made them as much who they are today as it had made them smart because she's smart and she taught them smart. And, you know, Sarah's graduating a year early, and I know we got some others here that's, that did the same thing back there. I remember a couple of them walls, I think, graduated early. And, uh, you know, she had the vision. We have to have vision, amen? We have to have a vision. And I want to I just talk about leadership today, about being leaders. And I just got three points. And my first one is leaders must have vision. Andy Stanley gave a definition of vision I heard the other day, and it's it's a mental picture of what could or should be. It's a preferred future. What's your preferred future? What do you want your life to look like in 20 years? What do you want your children's lives to look like? What do you want uh, the place that you have influence at look like, whether it be here at church or at at work? What, What do you want to see down the road? If you don't have a vision for that, it's not going to come to pass because you're just aimlessly wandering and you're just kind of going through the motions. And it's real easy. I don't know about you all, but, you know, my, my parenting style was, uh, get away from me, kid, you know. I kind of have a W.C. Fields approach to it, you know. Let mom, go talk to mom, you know. That's, yeah, maybe not quite that bad, but no, you're saying no. Okay, but... Uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> I maybe didn't do that, but that's, that's what I wanted to do. Anyway, uh, what's your mental picture? What do you want to see happen? And we've all heard the Einstein quote, the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Einstein was pretty smart, I understand. I don't know, never met the man, but... Uh, I know he has funny pictures, <laughs> if you look at him. Anyway, he, uh, he basically was saying a very interesting thing, and I've heard it before. If you keep doing the same thing, you're going to keep getting the same results. If you don't like what you have now, you've got to change what you're doing. You've got to change it up. You want, you want a closer relationship with God? You can't leave out the fellowship and the study and the prayer and those things that get you close to God. If you want to be more successful in your business, if you want to have uh, more, more control over your children at home, if you want to be a blessing to total strangers, you got to do something different than what you're doing now. What do you want for your future? What do you want for your family in the future or your business or your role as a minister or whatever it is? What do you want? How's it going to happen? Without a vision of what it is, and here's the thing, some people couldn't even answer what they wanted, let alone the steps on how to get it. You've got to figure out what's your vision for life. What do you want? The things that happen with leaders is that leaders have a vision, amen? People who see ahead of time and say, this is where we need to be, this is where we need to go. You know, one of the greatest things, one of the greatest tools I've ever seen was Dave Ramsey's courses for a vision of finances because you look at those Dave Ramsey courses and you follow along and go the direction. You man, you start cutting back on your, you, you start paying off those credit cards and getting out from under stupid debt. I mean, no stupid debt. You get out from underneath that and you start snowballing and then you start saving and you, you have a reserve savings while you're doing all that. Praise God. 
it, it gives you a vision of how you can be free financially. And we need those kind of tools to help us be free. You know, some of you probably, if you went and took ISOM courses, you'd have a greater vision of what you'd want to do with your life simply because of the impartation of the spiritual revelation that they give, not only on study of the books of the Bible and how to pray and all these other kind of courses that you take, but it's just the attention that you have to start giving to God's Word. It doesn't mean you're going into full-time ministry. Are you going to do anything that, you know, like that? Although I think some of you should be. And let's face it, a dream without action is fantasy. It's not vision. You can have a big dream, but if you don't follow through and do what you have to do, it's not going to happen. Lois has a dream of starting a halfway house for people getting out of jail who are struggling with drug addiction and stuff. If she doesn't follow the steps that she has to do, and we've talked about steps, it's not going to happen. You can have a big dream. You can have a big, 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 big vision. But if you don't do anything, nothing's going to change. If you keep going around the same mountain, besides one leg getting shorter than the other, because you have, <laughs> all right, you have to picture that. Get a vision of that. Anyway, uh, you have to deal with what it is that's keeping you from doing what you want to do. And last week I said this, you'll not be able to achieve what you cannot believe. You'll never achieve what you can't believe. If you don't believe you're going to be able to achieve great things for God, if you don't believe that you're going to do what it is, you're going to get things straightened up, you're ever going to amount to anything, then it'll never happen. I thought it was so funny when Scott went around and got videos for my... Uh, 50th. I know some of you didn't even realize I was over 50, <clears throat> but uh, because I married such a younger woman, that's what happened. But uh, but Scott went around. And he was getting videos, and it was just one of those God things. He stops at a store in Lexington. And he was trying to figure out where to get to Nab, and there just happened to be a lady in there that I've known all my life who was in the same grade as my sister, who's 10 years older than me. And he mentioned he was trying to get to Nab, and she wanted to know where he was going. And she said, Carl, you know, Carl you know, to Roger Dean's parents' house. And she's like, oh, I know what that is. So she took him there. And, uh, you know, that's Nab and Lexington. And uh, so, she, so they went up to Nab, and they're videotaping my dad for the 50th thing and my parents. But my dad goes, yeah, I, we never did know if he's going to mount to anything or not. ha, <laughs> I'm, thinking, oh, I'm not sure I have yet, Dad, you know. Well, yeah. Dad's doing well, by the way. He's got, he gets to spend the weekend with, with the, the siblings because we have district council. We have a, have a uh, funeral, a wedding, a board meeting, and then district council for a couple of days. So, busy time. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, very Memorable scriptures. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. If you get a vision, if you get a vision for your life, if you get a vision especially from God, you got to take note of what that is. You write it down because you want to remember it and you want to find steps in order to implement it. There has to be action with it. You have to run with it. Amen? There's got to be something behind the vision. There's got to be something that causes it to come to pass. It just doesn't happen on its own. Now, saying that, there's also a certain amount of waiting that you have to do, tearing for it. And that doesn't just mean you just sit on your hands and don't do anything. You continue to do those things that... That, uh, that you're supposed to do. It's like giving. You sow the seed and you don't expect it. It doesn't come back up immediately. You cast your bread on the waters and after many days it comes back to you. There's a process that's involved. But most of the process isn't making it happen. God could do that instantly right now and he does occasionally. He does. Sometimes things are just like boom, it just happens right now. There it is. Sometimes you just had this inkling that something might happen, and boom, it's already happened before you even had a chance to even think. But in most cases, the tarrying, the waiting, 
is not on God to do what he needs to do, but for what he needs to do in us in order for us to be ready when it's time to do whatever the vision's saying. Because the vision speaks, but there's a process of hearing that we have to go through, of learning, of following. You see, the greatest leaders have been the best followers, not just of their mentors and the people who are ministering to them and those kind of things, their bosses or their school instructors or whoever they might be. It's following what the Spirit of God is saying. There is an appointed time for the vision. That means God's God's got a time for it. Amen? And you and I have dates stamped on us for those times. They're not expiration dates. They're expectation dates. Woo, write that down, somebody. Hallelujah. (laughs) God is good. This leads us to the second, yes, all the time, a second point, which is leaders must have clarity. If you write it down and make it plain so that the person who reads it can run with it, then you have to have clarity for this. Leaders must have clarity. Clarity means making it clear. Amen? It's like the voicemail for the septic tank cleaner. At the tone, give us the scoop about your poop. Beep! Yeah, I know. Now that's pretty plain, isn't it? Hallelujah. That's clear. You know exactly what to do when that happens. Hallelujah. I hate calling these places and you get their machine and it says, if you are having disgusting troubles, please, please place number one if you want to reach so-and-so. And then if you want to reach this other person, please two, please, 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 you know, and you're going, what the heck am I supposed to do? And does my situation fall under number one or number two? And you preach number two and you find out, oh, wait a minute, number two, I got the septic tank again. All right. Anyway, moving right along. Do you know what? When, peop- when they do polls asking people what they want in a leader, what's the number one thing do you think that they want? Answers? Somebody else to do all the work. <laughs> no, the number one thing in polls is integrity. They want somebody who's honest. But, but as much as we say that, We don't follow that necessarily. We follow the people who are the clearest. We follow clarity. We don't necessarily follow integrity. Let me let me ask you a couple. I'll ask you a couple questions here. Okay. Two thousand eight, President Obama. What was his slogan? Change. It was change you can believe in was how it started, but it kind of boiled down to change before it was all over with. What was Hillary's? Exactly. We don't remember what that was, do we? Solution for America. That was one. She was on her fourth one. I think she's on her fourth one now. Hillary for America is what one of them boiled down to, I think. But Okay, Bernie Sanders this year. What was his? And it wasn't fill the burn. Even though, you, even though we heard that, it wasn't fill the burn. That's what we'd got if he got elected. Never mind. Hallelujah. Anyway, anybody know? No. <laughs> no. A political revolution is coming. That's not, ooh, that's not memorable. What about Ted Cruz? And he was on his fourth one. Anybody know that one? Reignite the promise of America. What about Donald Trump? Make America great again. Very simple. Very, I think he added to Ronald, somebody said he added to Ronald Reagan's. He added again to it because maybe Ronald Reagan's was make America great, but. So make America great again, and who do they vote for? Donald Trump. Who has the lowest score for integrity of everybody running? Donald Trump. Now that's a sad thing, isn't it? 
But what it shows us this morning is not the political situation in either one way or the other. It shows us the power of clarity, of being clear, of being able to share what your vision is. If you've got a vision for your household, the rules need to be simple. You need to be able to tell the kids, this all is the rules. Amen? You, you can't have all kinds of confusing things and changing it one week to the next and changing it for one kid over another kid. You can't do that in church either. We have rules. You act this way, we act this way. And believe it or not, whether you noticed or not, we still have men's and women's restrooms in our church. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We are not changing that. Teddy Roosevelt said, To educate the mind and not to morals is to educate a menace to society. Hitler took a microphone and changed the world. That was clarity without integrity. Because his purposes, if you study about Hitler, all the people who supported him early on were murdered before the war was ever over with. He changed gears as he went along, and he got worse and worse people around him, people who wasn't just buying in now to, you know, some of his propaganda, but they were buying into an evil thing that was going on. We don't need evil, amen? We need God. And let me tell you now, big dreams need big teams. You probably aren't going to get what you want done by yourself. You need other people. I have a vision. I have a dream. Hallelujah. Dr. Martin Luther Dean. No. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> we, uh, I believe God's called us to plant churches. And then I can look around and go, oh, by golly, we need to fill this place up first. And I keep hearing, no, you don't. You just need to do what I tell you to do. It doesn't take a big group of people to go out and start another church. We didn't send that many down to burst sales. Now, over a period of time, we got about 20 of our people down there. That's part of where people are at. And then we're helping Church on Fire grow, too. So we sent about 10 or 12 over there. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> God bless them. Down, down, in, down in Versailles, they're all going, they're, they're, they've been sucked out of all the Baptist churches, and they're going to Bridge of Hope. Bridge of Hope's a great church, too. Hey, God wants us where we're supposed to be so we grow the way we're supposed to grow and accomplish what he's called us to do. But we've got to have clarity with what that is. So what you need to do, A, you need to state it simply. Make it plain. If you've got rules, if you've got goals, if you've got all these things, make it plain. How are you going to become? You think you're supposed to be a youth pastor someday? Well, how are you going to do that? Probably, if you never work with kids, it won't happen. Probably, if you don't take some courses, it may not come to pass. Probably, if you really think you're going to end up doing that a full time, you've got to look at it like a career, even though it's calling, but you've got to look at it like a career and study to show yourself approved unto God. And some of that approval comes for kids, too, or for the people who follow you. And like I said, if you have kids, you've got to have simple rules. Clean your room. Amen? The second thing, or B, that we need to do is cast it convinci convincingly. In other words, we've got to make people believe what it is that we think we're going to do. You know, I've had people tell me they're going to do this and that, and I kind of was skeptical. And I have been surprised over the years by some people who actually did exactly what they said, and they followed through and they did it. I've been surprised that some people even stay saved. You know what I'm saying? And you probably have too. But the truth is, God can take anyone and do anything with them. I'm evidence of that. Because I wasn't on the road to church I was on the wrong road, but he switched me over, and praise God. Part of our job is getting other people on that same thing. But you have to be convincing about it. When you're dealing with your children, and you're telling them these are the rules, and then you never enforce them, you have nothing but threats, but there's never punishment. 
or all you do is punish and you never have rewards, then you're going to err in it. Nothing's going to happen. They're going to learn that they don't have to listen to all that. And we need to reward good behavior. Amen? We need to reward Terry for taking the courses and people who do good things. And praise God. You know? The next thing we need to do is repeat it often. Partly because we have to hear it over and over. It's by the washing of the water of the word that we change our thinking and our minds by listening to God's word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. We're supposed to continually be filled with the spirit. It's not a one-time shot thing on any of it. The study, the, the spirit, all those things that we're doing, it has to be continual. It has to continue on. It has to be something that... that uh, that, that uh, has not only an impact, but an impart. Not only does it impact us, but we can impart that to others. Paul told Timothy to find faithful men to give it to and to pass it on to. So we have to be able to repeat it. The third thing, and that was A, B, and C. I may have said one, two, three on that. But anyway, leaders must have vision. Leaders must have clarity. Leaders must have priorities. If you don't make priorities, the little things are going to eat you up. How do you get to your preferred vision? How are you ever going to accomplish what you know God wants you to do for your life if you don't set priorities? Because I'm telling you, there's an old saying, the devil is in the details, and it is absolutely true. And it's not so much that, that uh, all the issues and problems and troubles that you can have it's the wasted time that you have. Speaking of troubles, let me uh, tell you. <laughs> uh, on their way, they, they, yeah, when they're getting ready to go to the wedding, uh, Austin's uh, vehicle has brakes go out on it, and they have to fix Austin's brakes. Getting ready to leave the wedding, Danny can't get his van started because the, the gas line went out, and they got stuck up there. Thankfully, the, uh, the church up there, the pastor, if you didn't know, Allie married a pastor's son, and uh, he pastors an Assembly of God church there in Mooresville. And anyway, they loaned them the church van or a van, I don't know, and uh, they were able to come back and get home. But, man, you give your most stressful day ever that you've ever had, your daughter's wedding, and you compound it by vehicle troubles before and after. And that's not counting the fact that Allie's car, one that Caleb, her husband, gave her, uh, was leaking something all over the place, too. So <laughs> just add to the trouble. You know what I'm saying? Let's add to the stress. And I'll tell you what happens when that happens. You can get frustrated or you can get elevated because you cling on to the hand of God and he pulls you up out of that. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't want to be in a pit. I don't want to be going under. I want to be raised up and lifted up out of it. But we've got to have priorities. In order to set goals and to get where you need to do, you have to have priorities. You've got to be able to put things in order. What action steps do you need in order to see your preferred future, to see your vision come to pass? What do you have to do? You really have to sit down and think about that. And the good thing is, if you will actually put it in meditation and in prayer, God will give you steps that will help you to be able to accomplish that. And I'll be honest with you, this is one of my weaker areas. Honestly. I mean, I think about things I want to do and accomplish and what I, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, well, how am I going to get that done? You see, my problem has been is I've always flown with Levi's, the seat of my pants. Amen? You, can't, you don't go where you're supposed to go. You fly by the seat of your pants. I like to call it being led by the Spirit. Isn't that what we do? Amen? Uh, uh. You know, you ask somebody to do something, well, I don't feel led. Well, probably the lead's in the seat of your britches. That's where it's at. That's why you're not doing anything. Hallelujah. Without priorities, you lose sight of what your goals are. And you start doing things that don't really fit into that. 
It's one of the reasons, you know, most companies now, they don't just have a vision, they have a mission statement. And if things don't fit into the mission statement, then you don't do it. Our mission statement at Church on the Rock is to reach the lost and the unchurched, bringing them into fellowship with God and our local body that they might be equipped to fulfill God's call in their lives. It's not a hard one. It's a good one. I apparently memorized it. Apparently. If you haven't noticed, if you go down to the end of the hall, we actually have it on a nice-looking uh, acrylic. Uh, it's not a painting, but it's an acrylic banner-type thing. And uh, we're going to do some painting out here in the foyer, and it'll be moved down here in the foyer at some point. That is our mission statement. Things that don't pertain to that, that it doesn't, it doesn't. Now, but that's pretty wide open. We could be doing a lot of stuff to fulfill that. But that's the individual visions that people in the church have to have in order to see it happen. Where do you start? Where do you start with priorities? Let me give you, let me give you where to start. God, family, church or work, depending on where your heart's at. Some people, they don't feel called to work in the church, so that's going to come in fourth, but some people feel like they're called into ministry and they've got to go with church before work. And, you know, there's a transition that takes place. You know, Pastor Danny's been in and out of workforce and on the workforce and in and out of the workforce, and he's been full-time with us before, and he's full-time now, but he's also working now. <laughs> it's just, you know, some of that has to get worked out. But if you put God number one, and he's the number one priority in your life, then you spend time with him, amen, and you get that worked out first. And you also spend time with your family, and you focus on your family and how you're supposed to deal with your family if you have one, and you're supposed to minister to them. That's number two. The guys who lose their kids, and I'm talking about pastors who lose their kids, it's because they didn't have any focus on their kids. Their focus was always on the church. And church takes over. And the thing about it is church and work can begin to rule us, and they even takes the place of God if we're not careful, especially if you're in ministry, because the next thing you know, you're busy, and you're doing this, and you're doing that, and you got this meeting, and you got that meeting, and you're leading this group, and you're leading that group, and you have to go visit this person, and you have to go, you know, spit in somebody's eyes, which I like doing, but... I don't get that many calls for it. Oh, yeah. Well, my phone's going to light up today, Ron. Just wait. All the people want me to come and spit in their eyes. Oh, yeah. Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. If we put God and his word first, we're going to have good success. We're going to be prosperous as we meditate day and night to observe, to do according to all that is written in it. But there's a principle here that also goes with the principles of leadership. If you have a vision and you've written it down, then repeat it to yourself, go over it, go over your action steps, your plan that you have in order to complete it so that you stay on course and it will be prosperous. Now, I'm not saying replace the Word of God with your vision or your goals and your action plans, but I'm saying that if you do the same kind of a thing and you give thought to it, you're going to see things happen. You're going to accomplish what it is that you're supposed to do. Coach Saban, some of you heard of him from Alabama. I know all the Alabama fans here. Nobody. <laughs> his, his acronym for, for, uh, for this it is WIN. WIN, which is, should be every coach's thing. But for him, WIN stands for what is important now. And sometimes you have to, you have to, Focus in seasons on things that are seasonal towards your vision and your goal. You have different steps and things. And sometimes you can't let step one go while you're working on step three. 
But step three is needed at this time, and that's what you have to do now. And you've got to work on that, and then step four, and then step five. And sometimes you don't, you don't ever stop doing step two because it's something that has to keep going because it's integral to what you're doing. How many of you know that you don't, the minute you get in a plane, you don't put it on autopilot? You've got to be up at a certain altitude and go in the right direction and everything before you put it on autopilot. Most businesses don't even get off the ground, let alone ever get to autopilot. And some of us, that's the way we are with our families. We're on autopilot. We're not really considering what direction those kids are going to be going. Cat Cooley says, focus on the things small enough to change, but big enough to matter. Small enough to change, but big enough to matter. I can't change everything, but there are things I can change. And if I focus on those things and I can get those things changed, then the things, and there are things that matter, they'll help me to change the bigger things as I go. That's why, that's why Dave Ramsey doesn't have you <coughs> pay off the house first. You pay off the smaller bills first. Because then you can snowball that and put more to the next bill and more to the next bill. There's a process there. So you have a preferred future. Do you have a preferred future? What skills do you need? What personal changes do you have to make? What habits do you have to overcome to see it happen? What attitudes have to line up with God's word? Who can help you with what you want to accomplish? Who's got the skills you don't have? Who's got the time? <coughs> Hallelujah. Pastor Cheryl and I talk a lot about the planting, the churches. And, and you guys don't realize this, but I, I keep going to Rising Sun every time, every once in a while, and I go down and settle on the river and drive around. It you, you doesn't take long to drive around Rising Sun, does it, Dean? <coughs> Ohio County only has about 5,000 people in the whole county. Half of them live in Rising Sun. As far as I know, the whole county does not have a Pentecostal church. And I don't know if that's why I keep feeling drawn down there. But we've been talking about planting a church down there years ago. And, and that's when Dean lived close. And we thought maybe we'd send Dean over there. And, and we went and we explored it. We had some healing meetings. Oh, had some meetings there. But the opportunity to merge with Batesville happened. And we merged and came up here. And that needed a, a season of work, you know. We had to concentrate on this and getting ingrained in the community and that kind of thing. And now I can't get out of stuff. I'm, I'm ingrained in everything up here. It seems like every time I turn around, somebody's wanting something. But, and I'm not talking about in the church. I'm talking about people in the community, which in Versailles, we never had that. There was nothing to join in Versailles. There's nothing to be involved in. They had a Lions Club, and five or six other preachers were in the Lions Club. And I thought, that's a small pond to be fishing with. You know what I'm saying? There was too many, too many guys in there doing the same thing. There wasn't, wasn't a purpose for me to go. The jail at that time was all sewn up. Now we're doing jail ministry down there, so something opened up there for us. But I keep going to Rising Sun, and I keep thinking, you know, how are we going to do this? And I, I got an idea, but I don't have action plans because it, maybe it's not the season yet for that. Maybe it's not the time. I like what Ollie had to say about about society and if we don't pray things through they're not going to happen amen if we're not going to spend time in prayer so i invite you to pray with me about these things but there's people in this room that are going to be involved in that church plant that's going to help with that you can say well i live too far away well god will deal with you about how that's going to work amen you know i don't know i don't live any closer here i live further away from rising sun than i do here i think and maybe I don't, but it sure seems like it because there's no good way to get to Rising Sun. It was like that one time I was in, I was in a, a, a little town. Where, what was the name of that little town? Oh, I can't think of Manville. Anybody know where Manville is? Okay. I was in Manville, and we stopped at the general store, and I went in, and there's a little town 
close to Manville called China. That's down by Canaan. How many know where China is? Anybody know where China is? So I went into Manville's store, and I said, what's the best way to get to China? He said, helicopter. <laughs> and that's about the way it is to get to Bryson's son, i got to tell you. I, I, you take that one road, or you go way out into Aurora and come back. Well, it's only seven miles out of Aurora about that. But anyway, so I've been going to Rise and Sun. How am I going to do that? I don't know, but I'll let you know because I've got to start focusing on it. And here's the thing. If we go down there, who's going and who's doing the preaching and, and who's going to be preaching here? We've got Pastor Danny down at Versailles. Who's going to be up here? Helping with this. Oh, Pastor Cheryl. Well, I'm glad you all agree with me. Hallelujah. Anyway, we may tag team. We may go back and forth. We may send somebody down there part of the time and somebody up here part of the time. I don't know. But I'm trying to get it off the seat of my britches and onto paper so that it happens. And now I'm going to show my true gift as a leader, and I'm going to close this in prayer. But I want you to think again. What is your preferred future? Don't just go home today and say, oh, you know, yeah, I better think about that. Let's really do it. What is your preferred future? What do you want to see happen? What do you want to see God do in your life or in your family's life? What do you want to see happen on the job? What do you want to see happen educationally? What do you want to see happen? What does God want you to do? Father, I thank you for the people who are here today. Now, Lord, I thank you that you gave us a big hug earlier so that I don't have to lay hands on everybody because this message is about us digging deep in ourselves and into you to find what it is that you want to accomplish through us, the path for our lives. And I pray that every person here, no matter how young or how old, they will consider where they're at now and where they want to be. If they want to be a doctor, they better start making good grades in school because you won't get accepted into medical school if you don't. If you want to be a minister, then you better start ministering and learning and educating and everything that we might want to do. A better parent than we start being a better person ourselves because we lead by modeling. And I thank you, Lord, that Every person in this room has some influence. I pray that they would use that influence for good, that even though they may not feel that they're a leader, there are ways that they lead. And I pray, Father, that we would have vision, that it would be clear so that other people could understand it, not just us, and that we would have the priorities in order to accomplish it. I praise you, and I give you a glory for it. In the name of Jesus, amen.